This is Paul Turner, the Immigration Barrister at Imperium Chambers. Uh, as promised, here's the video on the Balagajaya guidance as adopted by the Home Office. It's quite important um, because rather than it being incorporated into the previous general grounds for refusal guidance, the Home Office has decided to issue a new set of guidance uh, called False Representations. Um, and this was issued uh, at the end of September. Now, this guidance covers uh, false representations in their entirety. So it covers both refusals um, uh, under uh, essentially dishonesty, um, under paragraph 320, um, and it also uh, governs and, and covers uh, refusals under paragraph 3225. Um, and the, uh, so if you bear with me, um, the reason I think they've published this new guidance is as a direct result of Balakajari, and they've decided, in effect, to uh, expand upon the Balakajari and use it as a potential for other grounds for refusal. Now, the guidance itself runs to some 12 pages and covers the initial uh, aspect of it, such as uh, what is a false representation, uh, and that was set out in uh, AA Nigeria, uh, 2010 EWCA CIV 773. Um, in, in respect of that case, it was a paragraph 3221A case, and it said that the, uh, the dishonesty uh, is needed. Um, and that it doesn't have to be on the part of, of the applicant, but there must be a dishonest representation that's made. That's fairly trite law, and a lot of people are, uh, are very familiar with that case law. Now, uh, how the guidance is set out is uh, it, it falls into two categories. The, the more classic uh, false representation, which is that under 327A, um, and 327B, that's either for applications for entry clearance for the initial application or 327B um, if it relates to a previous application or if it's for an application for leave to remain under 3221A or the, that's for a current application or paragraph 322 uh, two, if it's uh, there's been uh, false representations in a previous application. However, um, what there is now is there's now a, a subheading called a public policy grounds um, and this is where Balagajari really cuts in because previously it won the, the burden was on the Secretary of State to establish dishonesty and, and not merely a mistake um, and that was really it un, under, under the uh, false representations but now public policy grounds has, has come to life following Balagajari um, and it, it's clearly expressed um, as being a result of that decision and in respect of entry clearance uh, if you are caught by uh, the public policy grounds which I'll come to um, you'll be refused under paragraph 320 um, subparagraph 19 um, and if it's an application for leave to remain it will be surprise surprise paragraph 3225 um, now, the guidance makes express reference to the case of Balakajari, and it said that dishonest conduct was capable of falling within the public policy provision provided. Um, but it also said that n not all dishonesty is sufficient to meet the threshold. But um, and the dishonesty doesn't need to be crim. But it also says that the dishonesty doesn't need to be criminal to meet the threshold. So there's a bit of wordplay there. So basically, if someone's done something deceitful or dishonest, but it's not criminal, um, it can still fall under the uh, three two two five refusals. Now, in uh, the, the guidance also summarises Balagajari and summarises that that. In essence, uh, the people had, had given different figures to HMRC uh, and on their application forms. It refers to that. Um, uh, but 
what it says is there's a, a two-stage test really which is firstly has there been dishonesty or a false representation um, and whether that conduct is sufficiently serious um, to justify a refusal though generally the policy is that it will be um, sufficiently serious if there has been deceit uh, involved in particular with entry clearance applications um, the the guidance makes it clear that the represent that to the burden and standard of proof um, the burden is on the secretary of state to show that the representations uh, were not true and crucially that there may be um, or there has to be um, dishonesty there so there's two elements the evidence isn't correct and that there was dishonesty involved in the decision um, uh, the guidance recognizes that allegations of dishonesty are very serious um, for the applicants and their families um, and then refers to the balance of probabilities um, being made out um, what is quite important and quite um, realistic is that, that merely giving different information or information that's not correct might simply be a mistake and that caseworkers must consider whether the mistake is an innocent mistake. It says that, that you must not refuse um, on the grounds of false representations if it's an innocent mistake or it's minor or it's an immaterial mistake um, such as a typographical error. One of the examples they used that, it, that if an individual put in, they claimed that they earned 40,000 but only put in 4,000 pounds worth of um, uh, pay slips, that could be seen as an innocent mistake. Um, though they go on to say that, um, uh, that, that, that if that meant that the person didn't meet the rules, then the application would still fall for refusal. Um, they've also set out some guidance as to what could be a, an innocent mistake and some of these seem quite obvious but it might be helpful if I read them which is how easy um, would it be to make a mistake also and this is important in respect of uh, people with their tax and information that's held by another government department how likely is it that the applicant was unaware of the issue for example um, are they aware that the information has been provided previously or are they aware that the information is incorrect uh, also, does the uh, false information benefit the applicant? Um, is it contradicted? Uh, is the information contradicted by information that's given on the application form or any other documents that have been provided with the application or a previous application? Um, and then, does any uh, it mentions if it, is there any discrepancy between the stamp in the passport um, and any answer given subsequently? Um, uh, another innocent mistake could be that you've provided a, a new passport um, and uh, also has the innocent mistake been made on a previous application so people that make innocent mistakes or uh, and they look apparently innocent um, should be okay again if you're refused and you consider that it's an innocent mistake such as the misplacing of a decimal point so as to give a different figure or that you've consistently ticked the, the, the wrong box then that points more towards an innocent mistake and something that you might want to challenge. Now uh, what the Home Office has done following Balagajar is it's inserted a section on procedural fairness so the Secretary of State has taken on board um, what the Court of Appeal said in Balagajari and what they, they say is that in certain cases um, where the Secretary of State is either going to refuse an application or curtail leave or refuse entry, uh, entry clearance an applicant must be given the opportunity to address that allegation before a decision is made and they've adopted um, the terminology from uh, Balagajari in that the Secretary of State must and this isn't may this is must they must produce a minded to refuse notification which means that you must tell the applicant why or you must tell the applicant that you are thinking of refusing the application based upon false representations you must set out exactly what the allegation is 
and make it clear that you are alleging dishonesty. This obviously didn't happen in, in the Balagajari cases. There was nothing in the questionnaire or the interviews that, that did it. So this is a, a big step forward in that regard. You must give the applicant, says the guidance, the chance to respond to the allegation. And you may, you may give the minded to refuse notification um, for, in the light of a response uh, whether there is sufficient evidence that the applicant has been um, dishonest. Um, so this is an important step forward. You must also give the, the applicant a reasonable period, says the guidance, in, in which to respond to the minded to refuse notification. Or uh, if the applicant wants to provide further evidence, then you should give them, uh, says the guidance, you should give them the opportunity of providing that. Now, the guidance is vague to some degree because it says you should give people the appropriate opportunity to provide that evidence. Though it does go on to say that, that normally uh, 14 calendar days will be sufficient. Now, in those circumstances, if, for example, that you're seeking to get hold of bank statements or you're seeking to contact your previous accountant or you're seeking to gather evidence from abroad, then I would advise that you contact your lawyers and you get your lawyers to get in touch um, with the Home Office as soon as possible, well within the 14 day period and ask for an extension of time. If you do that and the Secretary of State then goes on to refuse the application um, and you've put in a, a request for further time, then you've probably got a reasonably good claim if there's good evidence and there's a good reason for extending time for a, a, a reconsideration or potentially a judicial review. Now, the Secretary of State has also quite qualified the minded to um, uh, refuse uh, notification by saying that it, it must be issued where two factors apply. One is that the applicant, and this is a bit vague, and may not necessarily know about the information that you have. Um, and what that means is that, that if you've got information such as a previous application or details relating to tax figures, um, then that will be a trigger to providing um, uh, the minded to refuse letter. And the second point, which is uh, very, very important, is the implications for an applicant of a finding of dishonesty as significant. So there are two factors. Is it information that the applicant may not necessarily know about? And are the consequences of the finding uh, significant? Now, that can mean that uh, those people that are making applications in country for leave to uh, remain um, are given the minded to uh, refuse letter. But individuals abroad who are only making an application for entry clearance and haven't established any rights or got used to being in the United Kingdom may not get the minded to refuse letter. What's very important in the guidance is that it spells it out quite clearly and it's in bold so that everybody can see it and hopefully most caseworkers will is it says that you should tell the applicant that you are alleging dishonesty and give them to uh, an opportunity to respond if you are refusing on public policy grounds based upon false representations. So there it is, it's quite clear that the Secretary of State is will um, or should um, spell out the allegation, spell it out clearly what they are alleging and they should give you a, a reasonable period of time in which to respond to it. Now that's, one might think that's the end of the matter. But it wasn't the end of the matter in the case of Balagajari. I think it's paragraph 35, I think it is, or 34, that talks about um, discretion. Because the Secretary of State does consider that obviously paragraph 3225 is a discretionary uh, refusal, though reading the guidance it seems more akin to a mandatory refusal now. But they, the Secretary of State does reserve the, the right to exercise discretion in certain circumstances. And in those cases, um, the application, what the Secretary of State says is that applications where there is dishonesty that's made out or the minded to refuse notification hasn't been adequately 
um, addressed um, should normally be refused. However, the Secretary of State notes that there can be mitigating factors, including human rights, um, and the, which are raised in the minded to refuse uh, no, response to the minded to refuse notification. Um, and they expressly state from the Court of Appeal that the, given that the seriousness of a, a refusal um, could mean that somebody has to leave the country or it could affect families and what have you, that the Secretary has to carefully consider any mitigating factors, even if there were false representations, and that's spelled out in the guidance. Um, it, it does say, um, uh, in usual Home Office uh, double negatives, that, uh, that there can be circumstances where a person's presence is not undesirable, where their case is considered as a whole, which is what's supposed to happen in paragraph 3225, where there are positive factors, and the example uh, that's given is um, where there are outstanding contributions to the community that outweigh the dishonesty. Um, so if you have done something particularly uh, fantastic or you've con contributed to the community, then there's always the possibility that the, that the Home Office will still grant leave though it's vital that any minded to refuse um, uh, response is as detailed as possible and contains as much evidence as possible. Again, um, another basis for uh, not um, refusing would be that it, it breaches an individual's human rights. Um, and if the response to the minded to refuse notification is as the Home Office says, particularised enough, then you should treat that as a human rights claim. And if it is a human rights claim, then there ought to be a right of appeal, or the Home Office says there will be a right of appeal. So if the, you are presented with the uh, minded to refuse notification, as I said, it's vital that you spell everything out, including the human rights, and you particularise the human rights. It's not simply good enough, in my view, I might be wrong, but it's not simply good enough, in my view, to simply say, oh, oh I've been here for 10 years and I've established a private life. It will need to be properly particularised to explain how you've established a private life, what it comprises, uh, and why it would be interfered with, and why it shouldn't be removed. Maybe the individual's been here for 15, 16, 17 years, Whatever it is, whether they've got family, they've got children, the children at school, whether there's illness, um, and that's referred to as well, that should all be considered. And then finally, um, uh, the Secretary of State concludes by saying, there may be cases where individuals are, uh, can't be removed because of their human rights ground, and it's a good human rights case, um, but they would otherwise, uh, were it not for the human rights case, that they might fall for refusal um, under this particular rule. And in that case, the Secretary of State reserves the right to grant limited leave to remain rather than indefinite leave to remain. So there's, uh, in essence, uh, a number of stages. One, it can show that there's an it's an innocent mistake. Um, secondly, um, one could provide a... Uh, a detailed uh, response to the minded to refuse notification which shows that actually the allegation of dishonesty is not made out um, and then fine uh, and that should entitle one to ILR um, or, or there might be mitigating circumstances which again means that the Secretary of State doesn't choose to refuse the application um, and, and may still grant ILR um, and then finally there's the human rights aspect which could lead to the Secretary of State still not granting ILR but because of the strength of the human rights claim granting limited leave to remain. Now this has probably gone on for far too long but this is an important piece of guidance. It is the first um, uh, specific false representation guidance issued by the Home Office. It bears the name version 1.0 um, and a lot of the others uh, tend to be uh, varied and amended as time goes on. But there we have it. 
So what Balagajari has done has essentially created a, a whole new basis and a whole new structure um, for people to be refused under public policy grounds um, and rather than just the old previous well you've put in a false document you knew it was false so you'll be refused under the relevant rule. Now um, you can be refused under uh, paragraph 3225 subject to again the issues of mistake whether there uh, is an explanation or whether you've got mitigating circumstances. I apologize for the length of this uh, video it, it's taken a while to put it together um, I hope it's been of some use um, please do not hesitate to contact me Paul Turner uh, at Imperium Chambers on 0207 242 3488 or at clarks at imperiumchambers.co.uk on my site the immigration barrister if you have any questions or you have any immigration problems or any family members have any immigration problems thank you once again for watching this is Paul Turner the immigration barrister at Imperium Chambers <laughs>